We'll read the book of Psalms, chapter 9, verses 1 through 4. Amen? Book of Psalms, chapter 9, verses 1 through 4. Hallelujah. You all have it tonight? Amen. Okay, we'll read the word of God in the name of the Father, the Son, and of His Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 And it says, I will praise thee, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will show forth all thy marvelous works. I will be glad and rejoice in thee. I will sing praise to thy name, O thou most high. When my enemies are turned back, they shall fall and perish at thy presence. For thou hast maintained my right and my cause. Thou sittest in the throne, judging right. Let us repeat the verse 4. For thou hast maintained my right and my cause. Thou sittest in the throne, judging right. Amen? You may be seated tonight. Amen. We have a saying in, in, in Curacao and in the other islands. You may be seated, but never sit on the praise, never sit on the worship. Let it be flowing continually, and so God will have freedom so His work can flow. Amen? Okay, so tonight we're going to talk about uh, under the title of uh, Who is Sitting on the Throne of Your Heart? Amen? Who is Sitting on the Throne of Your Heart? The Word of God says here that God sits on His throne. And he judges. He judges rightly. He judges, he judges righteously. Um, he gives each and every one according to his works. Whatever we do, God ju um, judges righteously. Amen. The word of God says the sun comes up for righteous and the unrighteous. God does wonderful things sometimes we do not understand. But the fact that he is on the throne, the fact that he is in control, gives us um, no right to ask God, why do you do this? Or uh, why do you use that? Why are you doing this in this way? Why don't you change the way you do things? So a throne is a, a signal of authority, a, of maximum authority. A throne is a symbol of um, complete control. Whoever sits on the throne has complete control over the, the country, the people, the citizens, every, everything that falls on his dominion. He is the one who is responsible for the growth, the development, and so on. He is the one who is in control, he or she. Because we also know there are queens and kings, right? So the, the throne denotes authority. And that is why the Word of God compares our hearts as thrones. And it is very important that we understand that the Lord wants the throne in our lives. Why does He want the throne in our lives? Because the Word of God says, the heart is very deceiving and who knows it? No one knows our, our heart. We never know where we can reach. We never know our limit. Our heart is deceiving. And so that's why God says in His Word, My son, my daughter, give me your heart so I may guide you to the righteous path, so I may show you the way in which you should go. Amen. So God wants to sit on the throne of our hearts. Amen. He wants maximum authority. He wants complete control of our lives. The Lord is a very zealous God. And if he, if he doesn't have the first place, he doesn't want the last one either. Either it's the first place, or it's nothing. God wants complete control of our lives, complete control of our hearts. He wants to be seated on the throne of our hearts. Amen. And tonight, we're going to see three persons, or three entities that can sit on the throne of our hearts. Amen. Three persons have the ability to sit on the throne of our heart. The first one you can see is God. As I said, God wants to sit on the throne of our heart. The Lord, the Word of God says in Revelation, if we go there just a moment, Revelation chapter 3, Revelation chapter 3, verses 20, it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will stop with him and he with me. This is God's invitation to let us let him come in and sit on the throne of our heart. God is a gentleman. He doesn't come in barging, break down the door and take control of our hearts. God gave us a free will. He wants us to serve him freely. He wants us to love him freely. He wants us to give, give him our lives freely, not under a bondage, not under a commandment, no, freely. That's why nowadays we suffer many things 
because of God's uh, uh, gift of free will. One day in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve had a choice. Eat the fruit or don't eat the fruit. And they chose, unfortunately, to eat the fruit. And nowadays we are suffering the consequences of that. But God has given us a free will because He wanted, He created man to worship Him. He created man to serve Him from a, a free heart, with free will. And he, if He wanted robots, He would have created robots. But he wanted someone, a, pre, a creature to praise him and worship him and serve him from the heart. We can see all of nature, the birds, the trees, the animals, every, every each and every one of them serve God. They have this instinct of the creator. They know who is their creator and they serve him free and they know what God wants for them. When is their time to die? When is their time to get born? God is in control of that. But God wanted a creature who would come to him and say, Father, I give you thanks for this. Father, I worship you. Father, I give you thanks. I praise your name from the heart. Amen. Something that would, uh, it would be a, um, a dual way. Not just one way. God giving and giving. But a creature that would give him back praise, worship, and thanks. And that is why he created mankind. To give him praise. The word of God says he created mankind in his image and his likeness. Amen. That's the note why he created us. He had angels, everything up in there, his throne, uh, the kingdom of heaven. Amen. But he wanted a creature that would praise. And the word of God says that the praise that we as redeemed, the worship that we as redeemed, give God. The angels can understand it because they've never gone through sin. They've never gone through trouble. They've never gone through tribulations. They've never gone through trials. So they don't have that, that special gift of giving thanks, worship and praise to God. And so when we praise God, the word of God says that the angels to care with God kneel down and to listen to the praise and worship that comes up to the heavens. Because it's a special song, a song of worship, a song of redemption, a song of praise and of freedom. Amen. So that is why God wants to sit on the throne of our hearts. He is one of the persons who has the ability, if we give it to him, to sit on the throne of our hearts. Amen. The second one, as I know you would guess, is the enemy or enemy Satan also has the ability and wants to sit on our heart. Contrary to our Lord God, he is not a gentleman. The word of God says, do not give space to the enemy. Do not give the devil any space. Because any space, it may be as small as one centimeter. If he gets that space, he will push through and cause big disaster, cause chaos, wreak havoc. Amen. He is not a gentleman. He just wants to destroy our lives. Let us go to Matthew chapter 12. And you may see there the difference between the enemy and God. God is just knocking here on the door, waiting for you to open it. And you see how the enemy doesn't wait for you to open the door and just barges in. Matthew chapter 12, verses 43 through 45. And it says, When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest and findeth none. Then he said, I will return into my house from where, whence I came out. And when he is come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. Then goeth he and take with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. Amen? So we can see the enemy is not polite. He won't come and ask, oh, give me a piece, of, a piece of land here, give me one space here. No, he barges in and causes destruction. As you can see here, this unclean spirit that is left alive, and the word of God says that the unclean spirit never leaves life. It only has to come to Jesus. Jesus cleanses us from our sins. That gives us the authority to cast out unclean spirits and so God may dwell in us. But what happened to this life? When this unclean spirit had left it, and turned back, for some reason, this person had gone astray, this person had um, departed from God's presence, this person had departed from God's ways, and so God has left the throne, because God is not dwell where we don't want him to dwell. Amen? As I said, God is a gentleman. And if you don't want him to dwell, he kindly leaves, 
and leaves everything he gave you. God gives gifts and he never takes them back. And so that's why when this unclean spirit came back, and he saw the whole house decorated and nice and clean. He said, okay, so this is clean. There's no one on the throne. Let me go back and take seven. Because the first time, they cast me out. So let me take assurance and go get seven more. So this time it will be more difficult to get us out of here. So we see the devil, the enemy also has the ability and wants to sit on the throne of our hearts if we give him that chance. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And the third person that has the ability to sit on the throne of our hearts is you and I. Amen? The Lord has the ability to sit on our throne. The enemy has the ability to sit and wants to sit on our throne. And we also, you and I, have the ability to sit on the throne. So, uh, let's go to the word of God in Proverbs 23. Proverbs 23, verses 26. And let us see what it says there. When we want to sit on the throne of our hearts and have control. Proverbs 23, verse 26. Hallelujah. And the Lord says, My son, give me thy heart, and let thy eyes observe my ways. It is God's will for us to let him govern our lives. But as the word of God says, there's a constant battle between the flesh and the spirit. The spirit wants to please God, but the flesh cannot please God. And sometimes we as human beings, uh, when God approaches us and asks us, My son, my daughter, give me your heart. Give me this little space here that is missing. You have given me maybe 80%. You have given me 99.9%. .9%, but I want complete, the complete heart. Every part of it. And sometimes we are sitting on a throne and we don't want God on it. We have the ability, as I said, God gave us free will. And if I say, Lord, I don't want you on my throne, and in some way you don't want the enemy on the throne, you say, Lord, I'm going to sit on the throne myself. But in, in other ways, you are, the enemy is sitting there behind you because you don't, it's not God that is sitting there. It's not God that has the control. And when you are sitting on the throne thinking that you are in control, it's the enemy behind you as working to cause destruction, working to cause death, working to cause pain, everything that is not pleasing to us as human beings. Amen. So three persons have the ability to sit on the throne. God, the enemy, and you. Amen. What happens? We're going to see now what happens when God is on the throne. What happens when the enemy is on the throne and we give him space? And what happens when I am sitting on the throne? Through the word of God, we're going to see what the Word of God says, what God wants for us tonight on the thrones of our hearts. Let's go to the book of Acts, chapter 7. We're going to see now what happens when we say, Lord, I give you my heart, I give you my soul, I live for you alone, and that you may have control of my life. Acts chapter 7, verses 55 to 60, it says, Acts 27, 7, 7, 55 to 60. Amen. It says, but he, talking about um, Stephen, amen. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then he cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stole him and the witnesses laid down their clothes at the young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they stoned him and they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to the charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Stephen was uh, a very clear example of a person who has the Lord on the throne of his heart. That whenever they would stone him, they would uh, mock him, they were angry at him, he would still, he still had the ability to say, Lord, do not lay this charge upon him, forgive them. Because the throne was occupied by the Lord. He was living for God and he knew that at that moment, his life was God's. And maybe, he, I don't know, you would, you would like to say that maybe he knew that God, through him at that moment, would raise many others 
would cause a, a, a revival in that country at the moment. And he knew that because God was in control, everything was fine. We know that when God is in control of our lives, no matter what happens, no matter what we're going through, there's hope, there's freedom, there's, there's life. We can expect something new. We, we go to sleep and we wake up and the Word of God says, His mercies are new every morning. We've gone through so much yesterday, but the Word of God says, yesterday is gone. Today is a new day and we have new mercy, new hope, new opportunities, new life, everything new. That's what God says in His Word. Behold, everything has gone past. Now, everything is yeah. new. New creatures. Amen. God renews. God does God wonderful things in our lives when He is in control. When He is on the throne of our hearts. When He is the maximum authority in our lives. And authority means um, not only when He does things that we want. Because that makes Him the authority. That if He gives us an order, if He says, my son do this. My daughter do that. And you, you're like, mm -mm, Lord, this is not the way I planned it. Lord, this is not the way I'm seeing it. Lord, this is not the way I, I think I should go. But because He is the authority, we humble ourselves and obey. Because He is in control, complete control of our lives, we just surrender because we know His way is the best. His will is the best. He knows better than we do. He knows what lays in the future. He knows about tomorrow. We don't. And in the of us, we have a saying, tomorrow has his, his name. Tomorrow is called Sunday. It, it, it's not called Jair. It's not called Juliana. It's not called Lee. It's not called Chris. No, tomorrow is called Sunday. We don't know tomorrow. Tomorrow has its own worries. We have today. And because he is in our hearts, on the throne of our hearts, today we have the, uh, the hope and assurance for us, a short tomorrow. Amen. Amen. That's when God is on the throne of our hearts. And when God is on the throne of our hearts, there's change. We come from darkness and turn to light. The things we couldn't see when we were in, in, in the hands of the enemy, now we can see because we have His light burning in us. It's a change. A change from sinner to redeem. First we were a sinner. There was no communion. There was no connection with God. There was no conversation between us and God. But now, when we accept Jesus, there's this bridge that comes through Jesus that we connect. To God, we are now redeemed. We can call Him Abba, Father. I can come into His presence and lay down my knees. I can come into His presence and say, Lord, I need You. Lord, I need strength. Lord, I need Your mercy. Lord, I need Your help in my life. That causes. That's what God does on the throne. He changes our lives for the better. Amen. He changes us from death to life. The Word of God says that uh, the reward of sin is death. But God came to give life and life in abundance. Amen. Because this life here on the earth is just life. But it's what happens after. That is the life in abundance. That is what you're expecting. That is what you and I, I hope, are longing for. To one day be in that presence. To one day be enjoying that eternal life. That life in abundance that He has for us. That He has provided for us through Jesus Christ. That now we can come to Him. We've come from death to life. We have uh, there's, there's hope, there's, there's um, assurance that even though we die, the word of God says, even though we die, we will live. He who dies in the Lord will live in his presence. He who loses his soul uh, uh, because of the Lord, because of God's will, doing God's way, doing what, what God wants, will win it. But he who always wants to keep his soul alive, alive, alive for the worldly things, surely he will lose it. Amen. So that's important. Why God wants to be on the throne of our hearts. When God is on the throne of our hearts, we have promises. When we're already at the side of the enemy, as we will see just now, we didn't have anything. Things would happen, and we will just suffer, suffer the pain, suffer the trouble, and see what happens. But when we come to God, He gives us promises. He promises, I will be with you till the end of days. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I am your healer. I am your provider. That is what God what happens when God is at the throne of our hearts. That even though we're going through trials, we can claim, we have come to God and claim, Lord, you are my shepherd. I shall not want, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me. He will never leave us. He gives us these promises to walk upon because he knows that we as human beings we need things to walk apart. Because when we were in the world, when we were on the other side, the enemy had us 
trampled, the enemy of the had us destroyed. And so when we come to him, he gives us new life. But with this new life, he gives us promises. He gives us gifts. He gives us so many things that we do not deserve. But because he is merciful, because he is gracious, he extends us this mercy and extends us these promises. Amen. Amen. He promised us also salvation. As we just said, he saves us, he redeems us. He gives us real life. He promises us eternal life. Jesus said, that's why he said, I go to a place, I go to prepare a place for you. And I can imagine that maybe at the time, he could see the faces and they were like, what is this man talking about? What place? We're here if we die, that's it. And he says, if it were not so, I would not tell you. But because it is so, I will go and prepare a place for you. Why? Because where I am, I want you to be also. So that the promise of Jesus changed your life, hope, and eternal life, promises, gifts that God gives us. Amen. And as I said, God promises us to be with us till the end of the world. They say that in the word of God, 365 times it is said, it is said, um, I will be with you till the end. Amen. I am with you. They say 365 times it appears in the word of God. And so they say it's for each and every day. You can take the promise and say, I am with you. No matter what you're going through, I am with you. You're going through pain, just say, I am with you. You are with me, Lord. I'm going to trouble, but you are with me. I'm going to trial, you are with me. I'm going through trouble in my home, my family. Claim your promise, Lord, you are with me. You have promised that, and I believe it. Amen. That all happens when He is on the throne of our hearts. Amen. Amen. When God is in control, when God is the maximum authority in our lives. Amen. Amen. And now we're going to see what happens when we let the enemy sit on the throne of our hearts. Sometimes uh, we don't want to think about those things. But we don't. Um, we don't like to think about it. But it's very important to be clear and know what happens when God is in our lives. And also what happens when the devil or when the enemy is in control of our lives. Amen. When the enemy is in our lives, we can see just there in Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5, verse 1 to 3. And it says, But a certain man named Ananias, with the fear of his wife, sold a possession, and kept back part of the price. His wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part, and laid it at the apostles' feet. And look what it says. What Peter said, Ananias, why had Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Amen? Notice what he says. He just doesn't say, why did you lie? Why did you do this? No, he says, why did you allow? You allowed Satan to fill your heart. And when Satan fills our heart, everything goes wrong. When God is in our life, Although the things seem going wrong, we know it goes right because he is in our life. But with Satan, it may seem right, but you know it's wrong. Amen. Amen. And so when Satan is in control, when he is on the throne of our lives, we see that he causes destruction. At first, it may seem as something very beautiful. When I speak to the youth, I use this um, comparison. I tell him, the devil comes to us as a billboard. You see, everything is nice. This beautiful hotel, this beautiful scenery. Uh, 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 um, come, come here. You will find freedom. You will find love. You will find whatever you're looking for. But it's just a billboard. And when you step into that billboard, and everything comes down, and you see the reality of life, but you're already in the hands of the enemy. And because the enemy came, as the word of God says, to kill, steal, and destroy. That is his mission. <clears throat> there was once this woman. Um, the sister that uh, once said she was praying for the devil to convert and the, the pastor had to tell her sister that is impossible the devil is condemned that is his work he kills he steals he destroys you can't pray for him to convert because it will never happen that is his job 
He doesn't want you to reach heaven. He doesn't want you uh, uh, to live for God. You know why? Because once he was there. Once he was there in the God's presence. Once he was there on the throne. Once he was there, a cherubim of God, a powerful cherubim, in charge of the praise, in charge of the worship. And that is why today we can see how the devil corrupts music. And he uses the music to transmit the message. He uses the music to transmit his, 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 his evil thoughts. Because that is his area. He, he was a powerful cherubim of praise and worship. And he knows what is going on up there. He knows how blessed it would be if you and I can reach over there. Once in a convention, um, this demon possessed uh, person, and they were praying, praying and praying to try to cast them out, cast them out. And he said, the demon spoke true this person and he said you don't know what you are uh, uh, um, because there was a, a group of people there that were living for God but you know what, today yes tomorrow no on and on and the demon spoke, spoke to this person and said you don't know what is up there I know what is up there because I was up there up there is beautiful up there is great but you don't uh, you don't uh, um, live for God and you don't want to reach there, speaking to what was going on at the moment. And that was kind of a wake-up call for us as Christians. If the devil, if the demons say that we don't know the value of what is up there, what do we as Christians do? What are we doing? How are we living? What do we want from God? Amen. So we as Christians should aspire to reach heaven. That is our goal. In a retreat just before we came here, I was in a retreat in Venezuela, a youth retreat. And one of the words that the pastor would say was, as young men and young women, we aspire careers, we aspire um, life goals. But many, many, many young men and women forget the most important goal is to live in such a way that one day you are rich heaven. That is the, final, the first and final goal we as people, as Christians should have to reach heaven. The rest comes along but make sure that that is your goal make sure that that is what you're striving for the word of god says seek ye first the kingdom of god amen and, righteousness, and all 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 things all other things will come as a blessing will come with his blessing to your life at the time at the moment at the place he wants it to be but have him seek him first in your life. Amen. So when the devil is on the throne, there is destruction. There is death. There is a, 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 um, who comes to kill, steal, kill, and destroy. There is false hope. As I said, he sets up like a billboard and says, come. This is the way. In that way, that way is narrow. You can't walk through it. You have to leave things behind to get into that way. But my way is free. You can enter it with your open arms. You can come into it with whatever you have on you. Whatever baggage you have, you can come into it. This false hope, I will give you freedom. In this way you can find love. In this way you can find a family. In this way you can find money. In this way you can find a home. But it's all a lie. False hope. False life. Because when you're in that way, that's when you see whatever you're going through. He's not there to help you. He's there to keep you going down. And to one day you will be. So one day you can be in hell with him also. Because that's his goal. As I said, we should be aware of it. We should keep that clear. The devil is not playing. He doesn't have time to play. We can see how the things, how the times are changing right now. How many things are happening. That means that God is near. And the devil has this amount of time. And he's not playing for like people want to come to the sorcerer. Oh, make him fall in love with me. Oh, I, I want the house, I want this. He says, I don't have time for that. I need to um, stop the redeemed from reaching yeah. heaven. That is his goal. That is what he does. That is what he wants. Although he knows he's already um, over one. He's already lost the battle. Still, he wants to try and see how many he can bring along with him. That happens when he is on the throne of our hearts. Amen. And the last thing that the devil causes is death. As I said, when, we were, when God is on the throne, there's life. There's new creation. There's hope. But the devil doesn't give you hope. It gives you false hope. With the end of death, to kill 
whatever God has planted in you. The word of God says in the parable of the sower, that he went abroad and sowed the seeds. But some of them fell on the stones and just fell there, dried up and dead. That is what the enemy causes. He makes us, makes our hearts as stone so that the word of God cannot come in. And so it just falls there and dries. And you will go drying and drying and drying. And what happens to a plant that dries? On one day, it has to die. And that is what the devil causes. As the word of God says, the wages of sin is death. There's no other results. It's as clear as one plus one is two. That's it. But he who accepts the eternal gift of salvation to Jesus has hope, has new life, amen, has promises. So that's what happens when the devil is on the throne of our heart. But he is the maximum authority. And as I said, the maximum authority. When it's, when it is God, he gives the order, but he leaves it to us to accept it and follow it. The devil does not leave it to you to accept it and follow it. He gives the order, you like it or not, and that is when, that is when the battle begins. Because when you realize you're on the wrong road, you're going down the wrong way, you're already chained. Because the devil, as the word of God says, he chains his prisoners and he doesn't let them go. And it, 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 the, the blood of Jesus is needed to free you from those chains. And that is what happens. As the, when the devil is the maximum authority there, he doesn't care for free will. He chains you, and he, as I said, for his goal of killing whatever God has brought into you and to bring you to hell. He chains us as the maximum authority. And he doesn't care. He's like a dictator. Whatever he said, that should happen. It's not like God when he is on the throne of our hearts. Amen. Okay, okay so now we're going to see. What happens when I am on the throne of my heart? Or when I think I am on the throne of my heart? Let's go to the book of Luke, chapter 12. Praise his name. Hallelujah. Glory Bless you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Luke, chapter 12, verses 16. And we'll see this parable where this man thought he was on the throne of his heart. Luke chapter 12, verses 16. And it says, And he speaks a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to restore my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and bail greater. And there will I restore all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, that's what he thinks, he is on a throne. Soul, thou hast much good laid up for many years. Take thy ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. But then God comes in and shows him the reality. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then, whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? Amen. When we think we are on the throne, in reality, we are not. As I said, the enemy gives us this illusion, but he is right there behind you, on the throne. You're on the throne. He lets you think you are on the throne, but he is there behind you, because he knows he's already won you over. Amen. When we are on the throne, nothing happens. When we are on the throne, we think, we think we have the control. The, exa the classic example of thinking we have the control is when you have wealthy people. That is why Jesus spoke through this parable. Thinking that money is everything. But when a sickness hits the family, you see that all the money you have, you may be a billionaire, a millionaire, you can't buy help. You can go from doctor to specialist to surgeon, whatever you want you will see that the money isn't worth anything because you cannot buy life, you cannot buy health, you cannot buy your way into heaven. Thank God. How many can thank God for that? Because I don't have the money to go there. Amen. Thank God. So when you think you are the throne, you think you are in the throne. When in reality you are not. When we are the throne, we think we are the owners of everything. Of everything. 
You think I am going to go through my life? I have a beautiful wife. I have my kids. I have my work. I have this house. I have everything I'm done. And you're like this man when he says, take it easy. Relax. Enjoy life. You've reached the top. Enjoy. When you think you control everything. When you think you are the owner of everything in your life. And then the voice of God comes. One way or another. And may it be fortunate to you that it comes in a good way. That it doesn't come through sickness. That it doesn't come through financial debt, financial uh, crisis. That it may come like it's coming tonight in a pleasant way. My son, my daughter, let me be the owner of your heart. That it, that it may not come like it came to this man when he thought he was in control of everything. When he thought he had everything. When he thought he owned everything. And this voice came to him, fool. Because it, you're, you're working foolishly, thinking that you are in control. And he says, down fool. Tonight, tonight, he didn't even give him a chance to put things in order, to make things right. Tonight, your soul will be taken from you. And all that you have, all you have done, all your businesses, your kids, your family, your wife, what would have been for? What is it worth if tonight your soul is going to be taken? And if it were to be taken to the better place, okay, but it wasn't going to be taken to a better place. Amen. So that, that's what the word of God says. If the word touches your heart, do not harden it. Amen. Because the word comes out. The word of God says if the word goes out with a purpose to do whatever he sends it to do. And it's up to us, whether we accept it or not, his word has gone out. There's no turning back. He doesn't take back his words. The word of God says, he has not come to condemn us. But if he who refuses him is already condemned, because the same word you refuse will condemn you. It's easy as that. When we think we are the truth of our hearts. Amen. When we think we're on the throne of our hearts, there is no fear of God. There's no reverence, there's no respect to the things of the Lord. And we live a life that doesn't please Him. And I said, you think you're in control. I don't need God. I have everything. I have my family, I have money. Even though you don't have money, there are atheists that don't have money, don't have so much. But still, they don't believe in a God. And I use this example always when Kids ask, how do you know there is a God? I tell them, you know what? Stop breathing. I can't. Why? Because I have to breathe to live. But you don't know if there's breath here to breathe. So why are you breathing? I don't know, it's automatic. And so I say, okay, I don't know, it's automatic. I need God in my life to live. We need God in our lives to live. And I tell them also in another example, it is like the wind. Do you see it? You don't see it. You, you don't see it, I mean. You don't see the wind. But it is there, you can feel it. And we need it, the wind to, to take the seeds. We need the wind to give us fresh air. We need the wind to cool. But it is there, we can't see it. And what the word of God says, as the wind goes, no one knows where it came from. Where it goes, so. Is the Lord. We need Him in our lives. We need Him. Because when He is God in our lives, then it's when we live a life that is not pleasing to Him. There's no reverence. We don't believe in the Word. We don't care about the Word. And suddenly, when this happens to our lives, then we want to run to the first church we find in our way. Oh, Pastor, please pray for me. Oh, leader, please pray for me. Go this. You have lost a lifetime that you could have given to God. But leading a life thinking that you are in control, that thinking of you are in control of your finance, thinking you are in control of your family, neglecting that there's a greater God. I just can't fathom or imagine how people can say there's no God. When you see these birds, this, this design of these animals, how can you say there's no God? When you see so much beautiful things, children, when you see a child being born, new life, 
Where did it come from? Where did it get the bread? Because we can do it as humans, but who gives it the bread of life? God. Amen. Amen. The word of God says that when He created man, He made him out of dust. But there was one thing. It's not just the dust or the earth that gave him life. God said when He created him, He blew into him the breath of life. That is God. So how can we say there is no God? Even Darwin, yeah. the famous man for the theory of evolution, is said that at his bed, dying, he says, everything I told you is a lie. There is a God. We can come from a monkey. There is a God. Amen. But the thing is, it already has gone so far through the world, and you cannot pick back the words you say. But at his bed, he acknowledged that there is a God. So when you think we are in control, think better. You are not in control. And it's not God that is in control either. It's the enemy behind you, blinding you to see the true God, to see who we wants to be in the in control of our life. Amen. So, in under the thrones of our hearts, and then let's finish in uh, Revelation chapter 3. Once again, Revelation chapter 3, verses 20. Revelation chapter 3, verses 20, where you just read, and it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Amen. God wants to be on the throne of our hearts. God wants to be in total control. But you have to give him that space. As he says, he's there knocking and knocking and knocking, waiting patiently. And may it be that you open it on time. Because not all of us get that chance of maybe at our dying bed we can still accept Jesus. Not many get that chance. Some go like this. Others, by God's mercy and grace, get the chance to make things right with Him, accept Him, ask for forgiveness, and so they go with the Lord. But we don't know how we go. Who knows how we go? And here, who knows how we will go? None of us. The Word of God says we have to be prepared at any time. Or you go, or He comes to get you. You have to be prepared for both of them. When you're leaving this earth, you have to be prepared. So when you leave from this earth, you can go to heaven because you have the ticket of Jesus to enter. Or if he comes to get his church, you have to be prepared. It's not preparing. You have to be prepared. Because when the trumpet sounds, the word of God says, in a twinkle of an eye. You won't get a chance. Wait, wait, wait. I'm coming, I'm coming. You can. It's like this. And you have to be prepared. Amen. 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 Let's to our feet tonight. Hallelujah. Praise His name tonight. Hallelujah. Give Him thanks. Give Him glory tonight. Lord Jesus, we praise you. We give you thanks. We give you glory. We worship you, God, for your name. We bless your name, Jesus. We thank you for your word tonight. Oh, Father, we want to pray, Lord Jesus, that I have to be blessed. Oh, Lord, that you heal. Oh, Lord, that you save. Father, that you rescue tonight by your powerful word, Jesus. Oh, we're going to marvelous way tonight, Jesus. We recognize that we need you in our lives. 